opportunity to come and to be with the church here at Laurel Canyon uh, this week. Express my appreciation uh, to the elders here and for the confidence that was placed in me to come and play a small part uh, in this gospel uh, meeting. I know that uh, the, the, the members are scattered somewhat. We've got... Could not be here this evening, but I'd be amiss if I just didn't say a thank you to all of those that had extended a hospitality to us, whether we were in your homes or uh, you treated us to a meal. Uh, we are very thankful for that. I said that this actually in 14 years uh, was the first time uh, that I was able to have my family travel with me out of town to a gospel meeting setting. And so I appreciate very much. It's been, it was a great experience for them. They've been with me in local meetings when we just are at home and we travel 10, 15 minutes across town or 30 minutes to another local church. They've been with me on those occasions, but they've never stayed with me for an entire week. Uh, they did drive home this morning, so my wife, Jennifer, didn't have to drive at night uh, this evening. It's not too far, two hours away, but uh, it was just safer for her to leave this morning uh, with three of the children, and Blake stayed with me today and kind of hung out with Dad. But appreciate so much the kind words that were extended to myself. Uh, appreciate uh, the kindness and the love and the generosity and the, the hospitality that was shown to our family. Uh, it, it's uh, quite um, a sacrifice to treat the preacher, let alone his family of six, uh, four children and his wife. And so I, I fully am aware of the, the sacrifices that folks uh, had made on our behalf, and we are just so appreciative uh, of that. I've said throughout the week that uh, members often are encouraged during gospel meetings. Uh, the, the word is preached. You kind of hear a new voice. Uh, you hear someone else come and stand in the pulpit and speak and deliver God's word. But at the same time, gospel preachers need encouraged. And I'll walk away this week having been encouraged uh, by the good church here. Lots of positive and good things uh, that are happening here in the midst of this local church and in the midst of God's people. And so... If you will, you just keep on keeping on. And you keep God at the center of your life and, and do everything you can to bring glory and honor to the name of God. Tonight we're going to look at our final study together in this series of lessons. Uh, I appreciate the, the statement that was made by Stephen as to where we read about the greatness of God, where we learn about the greatness of God, and of course that is in God's Word. And we've developed some lessons this week that kind of give us an idea concerning God's greatness. And there is indeed a number of other things that could be said, other lessons that could be developed in a series such as this one. But this week we've considered the greatness of God as creator. We just look around and we can stand in awe and amazement. The psalmist, uh, as you read through the psalms, by the, way, by the way it's been said if you want to learn how to pray, just read the psalms. Many of those psalms were prayers uttered by uh, uh, David or other, other individuals throughout biblical or Old Testament uh, history. But when those psalmists had penned or prayed, oftentimes they were praising God's wonderful creation. They were acknowledging God's majesty and His greatness as they themselves observed uh, God's awesome and wonderful creation. We talked about the greatness of God as provider. God is aware of every need that I have, both physically and spiritually. And God has set out to make sure that my needs, both physically and spiritually, can be met. We talked about the greatness of God as miracle worker. All throughout the Bible, we read about either God himself working a miracle, or those to whom God gave the ability to perform miracles. And when we observe those miracles, we're observing the greatness of God. We studied yesterday or last evening about the greatness of God as Savior. And... As we suggested, it's not necessarily that I could just pick one of those lessons to be above another. But obviously the greatness of God as Savior stands out for many reasons. When we consider what God has done to make salvation possible. And the Bible says that God gave, that is he sacrificed his son for sinners. And by the way, that includes me and includes you. Tonight we're going to finish or conclude this series of studies by considering the subject, the greatness of God as judge. As a basis for our study, we turn our attention to the book of Revelation, chapter 20. 
And so the Old Testament is about to come to a close. The Old Testament. The New Testament. The New Testament is about to come to a close. And in Revelation 20 and verse 11, John gives us a word picture of the judgment scene. And here's what John had to say. John says in Revelation 20 and verse 11, Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. And death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. My friends, the judgment is one reservation or appointment that you will not be able to cancel. You can cancel a doctor's appointment. You can cancel a dentist appointment. You can cancel a play date appointment. You can cancel any number of appointments in this life. But one appointment and or reservation that you cannot cancel is that concerning the judgment. In Hebrews 9 and verse 27, the Hebrew writer said, As it, it, as it is appointed for man or men to die once, but after this, the judgment. And there's nothing that you and I could do to change that. It's death, then judgment. No changes in between. In Acts 17, verse 30, when Paul enters into the city of Athens and he begins to proclaim or teach the gospel, Paul said, Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will. Make no mistake about it. There is an appointed day which God will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. How sure can we be about this? And Paul said in Athens, He that is God has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And so as sure or just as Jesus arose from the dead, there too shall be a judgment, a day of judgment, a day of reckoning. And Christ will be the judge. And so we've been given assurance of this through or by the resurrection of Jesus the Christ. So our lesson tonight is going to examine a little bit closer the greatness of God as judge. All of our points tonight, the main points, come out of the text of Revelation chapter 20, starting in verse number 11. Notice first of all tonight the greatness of God and authority. When you think about the greatness of God as judge, our attention is called to or drawn to the greatness or God's greatness in authority. John identified the throne of judgment as a great throne in Revelation 20 and verse number 11. You think back if you were able to be with us Sunday morning when we talked about Jonah. In Jonah chapter 1 and later in chapter 3, God refers to, or the prophet Jonah refers to, the city of Nineveh as a great city. And of course, if you remember our study, right? We say, Jonah, you're going to remember God's mercy. Don't forget the great fish or the great whale. It's a vital part of that narrative. But the book really is all about God's mercy. It's also about God's greatness. It's interesting that the word great is used to refer to the city of Nineveh. But really what you also have throughout that book in those four chapters is the contrast or comparison in regards to the city of Nineveh and God's greatness. The city of Nineveh was great just because of its size. It was a large city. It was a capital city. It wasn't great because it was filled with righteous people. But in contrast to that, God is great because God is righteous. And God is the one who finds or is in a position of authority. And so when you think about the word picture that is given by John in Revelation 20, he referred to that throne or judgment as a great throne. The judge, Christ, has all authority. In Matthew 28, we read about the Great Commission when Jesus tells the apostles to go out into all the world and preach the gospel. In verse 18, Jesus said, all authority, both in heaven and on earth. He has it all. 
If Jesus has all authority, that leaves none for me, none for you. The Catholic Church teaches that the Pope is the head of the church on earth and Christ is the head of the church in heaven. And I just, there's lots of problems with that, but here's one of them. If the Bible says that Christ has all authority, which it does, in Matthew 28, 18, if Christ has all authority, how much does that leave for the Pope? None. How much does that leave for me? None. The only thing that remains or is left is for me to submit to the authority or rule or will of God. The only thing that remains, the only thing that is left, is for me to subject my will or to submit to the authority of Christ. Christ has it all, both in heaven and on earth. Under the gospel dispensation, we're instructed to abide in the teaching of Christ. And so we're no longer under the patriarchal dispensation. God is no longer talking or communicating directly to man. We are no longer under the mosaical dispensation. The Ten Commandments and the ordinances contained therein have been nailed to the cross. They have since served their purpose. And so today we live in the gospel dispensation and we're told to abide in the doctrine of Christ. If I'm going to abide in, I'm going to do, I'm going to follow, I'm going to take heed to. The word doctrine just means teaching. And so we're to abide in the teaching of Christ. Divine authority has been revealed to men today through Christ. You think about Christ possessing all authority. Well, how, how has that authority been made known? Well, it's been made known through Christ. In Hebrews chapter 1, starting in verse number 1, the Hebrew writer opens up with these words. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. We just mentioned that. And so God communicated to man in various dispensations and by various means. But in verse 2, the Hebrew writer says, Has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Well, where do I read about? The authority of Christ has been revealed in the New Testament. Where do I find, where can I locate this authority? In 1 Corinthians 14, 37, Paul said, if anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. If Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, he wrote more than half of the New Testament. And so whether it was he or some other writer, when they wrote, they wrote with the pen of inspiration. And when they wrote in the New Testament, they were writing the commandments of the Lord. And so God, is not, God does not speak directly to man today. God is not talking to you and I through prophets today. This is how God is communicating to us today. God communicates to us, to you, to me, through the written, revealed word. Paul said, the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. And so this is where I find that great authority. Jesus said in John 12, 48, that he who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Here's the standard of judgment. And so we live in the gospel dispensation. The commandments of the Lord are revealed in the New Testament. That authority is revealed in the New Testament. That will be the judgment. The standard of judgment. I would suggest that it's a good idea that we take heed. That we start reading if we haven't already. And start reading. It's not, it's not going to be a pop quiz. God has made his will known. There'll be no, God, it's not going to be a legitimate excuse. God, I didn't know. So there we are before the great white throne. And God said, why didn't you obey? Somebody will inevitably say, why I didn't know. Well, if I don't know, it's not any fault of God's. Remember in the Old Testament, in the book of Amos, uh, the prophet Amos had spake about a famine for the word of God if you're familiar with that prophet. But in the days of Amos, yeah, they did have a famine for the word of God. But God put that famine or made that famine occur because they were engulfed in, in, in immorality and they disregarded his divine rule or authority. But you know what's sad? There's a famine today for the word of God, not imposed by God, 
but we've imposed it upon ourselves. It's clear to me that God has provided for a feast. And yet there are folks who are experiencing a spiritual famine. And there's no need or reason for it. One could argue that we have more access today as a whole, humanity, has a greater access to the word of God than at any point in the history of humanity. Yes, there are places around this world. Uh, the Bible's illegal in some 50 plus nations around the world today. But in many places, such as the United States of America, we have freedom of religion. And there's no legitimate excuse for us to not to open up the Bible, read and study, and to consider the authority or the greatness and authority concerning God as judge. Well, because the word of God will be the standard by which I will be judged, you will be judged, men will be judged, don't you think we ought to read it, believe it, and obey it? The greatness of God is revealed as he means what he says and says what he means. And I've come to really appreciate that. When God speaks, he means it. And when God says to do a thing, I best do it. We talked about that at dinner a little bit tonight. We talked a little bit about the plan of salvation and you know, why folks seem to make it so hard. You know, if, if God told me to, to, to go run around this building five times and to do so, I'd be saved. Why question it? Let's go run around the building five times. You know, so a lot of my favorite Bible stories. God told Moses, talk to the rock. Numbers 20. If God told me to talk to a rock, what should I do? I best get busy talking. Now, God doesn't tell me to talk to rocks today. But if he did, I best get busy doing it. If God told me to dip in the Jordan seven times, well, I best get busy doing the very thing he said. If God said not to do a thing, like not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, I best not do it. If God said not to touch the Ark of the Covenant, I best not do it. If God said do not offer up vain worship, I best not do it. Nadab and Abihu offered up strange or foreign fire, Leviticus 10, 1 and 2. You think God means what he says and says what he means? Read the Bible. And you'll read about the greatness of God when it comes to his authoritative voice. When God says a thing, he means it. How about number two? You think about the greatness of God as judge. You think about the scene that is portrayed in Revelation 20. We read about the greatness in sanctity. John identified the throne of judgment as a white throne. Revelation 20 and in verse number 11. The term white can be found more than 50 times throughout the pages of the Bible. White is symbolic of purity. We sometimes sing a song, oftentimes as a song of encouragement, right? White as snow. That's right. White as snow. Symbolic of purity. And here it is. Greatness and sanctity, right? Purity. You can't say that about all judges today, can you? Which is interesting, by the way. Uh, Lots of things going on in the news. Are there corrupt judges? Yes. Are they all corrupt? No. <laughs> right? Are there corrupt police officers? Yes. Are they all corrupt? No. That's one of the problems we have today. But think about the greatness of God as judge. There's, there's greatness in sanctity. This is a throne of purity. The sanctity of the judge can be appreciated. When you think about Jesus the Christ who was going to be the judge, he committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. We read about people who are in positions of authority, who find themselves entangled in the affairs of this life. But we don't have to worry about this judge. We don't have to worry about God being entangled, if you will, in the affairs of life or sin or unrighteousness. For his son, committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Matter of fact, the Bible says from the judgment seat, righteous decisions will be made. Romans 2 and verse 2. Paul said, but we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. Are there false witnesses? Sure. There were false witnesses when Jesus was being questioned. They brought in false witnesses when Jesus was put on trial. Are there false witnesses today? Yeah. There's testimony given today, not according to truth. There are those who are in positions of rule or authority or power who do not exercise uh, their actions or decision making according to truth. But the Bible says, but we know that the judgment of God 
When you and I stand before God in judgment, we'll stand before a throne that is great in sanctity, purity, holiness, righteousness. And judgment will be rendered according to truth. Notice number three. The greatness of God is judge. Well, it's great. God is great. And the judgment scene is portrayed as great. That is greatness and impartiality. The judgment's going to be universal. John said in Revelation 20 verse 12. John saw what? What did he see? The dead, the great, and the small standing before the throne. And so all are going to be judged. Kings, rulers, laborers, the rich, the poor. The judgment of one means the judgment of all. So no matter your race, your nationality, no matter your social status, no matter your lot in life, no matter who you are from whence you came, you will stand before Christ in judgment. And I'll be right there with you. In 2 Corinthians 5 and in verse 10, Paul couldn't have made it any clearer when he said, for we must all, the term all is universal. Again, king, servant, rich, poor, those in between. No matter your race, nationality, social status, lot in life. No matter from whence you came. No matter what family you're part of or what name you may have or don't have. We're all going to be there. Paul said, for we must. Uh, the word must, M-U-S-T, the English word must, is considered to be the strongest word in the English language. Because there's no way around it. It's not optional but required. And so, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he's done, whether good or bad. And so I'm going to give an answer for those things that I've done in my body. And you'll do the same. And every other person who's walked the face of this earth will have to give an account of him or herself. In Ecclesiastes 12, the preacher said in the Old Testament, verse 13, you know what he said, right? Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. So after the preacher has searched far and near, he searched in and out, he's looked everywhere, he, he sought the meaning and purpose of life. And after he has searched and searched and searched, this is the conclusion he's drawn. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment including every secret thing, whether good or evil. And that's another inter interesting aspect of the greatness of God and impartiality. It may be that a person could keep a secret from a husband, could keep a secret from his wife. A wife could keep some secret from her husband. And, and, and folks will do those things thinking that no one knows. Except that someone does know. God knows. And the Bible makes it abundantly clear that God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing. That ought to cause the hearts of men to tremble in fear. Because there's not going to be anything concealed in the day of judgment. But the secrets of men will be made known. The secrets of men will be judged in 1 Peter 1, verse 17, Peter said, And if you call on the Father, who without partiality. We don't have to worry about. It's not, it's not going to be a concern that we'll have in regards to the judge being partial. Think about it. I mean, probably one of the most classic examples today is professional athletes or people that, you know, singers... They get in trouble, and what happens to them? Oftentimes, very little, if anything. They hire the, the most expensive lawyers, and, and they find their way out of it. They, they pay their way out of it. You and I were to commit some of those same crimes, we wouldn't get out of it as easy. And I say get out of it, we probably wouldn't get out of it. There'd be some greater or higher penalty. Unfortunately, there are judges who are partial today when it comes to the affairs of men. Are they all? No. We won't have to worry about that with God. For God will do so. He will judge without partiality. According to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. So because this judge, God, Christ, his son, will judge without partiality, while we're here, 
We are to conduct ourselves in fear. And the idea of fear, more often than not in the Bible, has to do with respect, reverence, and awe. To fear God is to have reverence for God, to, to be in awe of God, to, to, to view God, to know God, to see God as he really is. That he is our creator, he's our provider, he's our right savior. Ultimately, he's our judge. John said in Revelation 20, 13, and they were judged, each one according to his works. And so I'm going to answer for my life and the things that I do in it. And you'll do the same. That's good. You won't have to answer for me. And I won't have to answer for you. I'll have to give an answer. I will be judged according to my works. And whether or not I've complied with God's will or rule. And we best take heed. There's no escape in the multitudes. You know, a lot of folks do things, even religiously, because everybody else is doing it. And just because other folks are doing it doesn't make it right. And how many times have parents told their children that? And here we have God the Father trying to tell us the very same thing. Except many of us, many of men, won't listen. There's no escape in the multitudes. And so God is impartial. All will be judged. Think about in Noah's day. Only eight souls were saved in the ark. 1 Peter 3 and verse 20. The majority were killed in the floodwaters. In 1 Peter 3, 20, Peter said, When once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. Just eight souls were saved. You know how long it took Noah to build the ark? Somewhere around 75 to 100 years. And Peter said that while Noah was building the ark, he was a preacher of righteousness. And so Peter's, Peter, Noah, Peter said that Noah is a preacher of righteousness. So Noah's building the ark, and he's preaching righteousness, righteousness being God's word, God's will. There's a flood coming, and you just imagine. The Bible doesn't lay it out for us, but just a little bit of reasoning. You imagine what people were saying about Noah when he's building this ark that's some football field and a half long. And then, based on the New Testament, it had never rained before. As God had caused the midst to come up from the ground to water the vegetation. And now there's going to be this worldwide flood, not just a local flood. There's going to be a worldwide flood. And here's Noah building this ark. Took him some 75 plus years. Well, I bet you those folks weren't laughing when the door to that ark closed up. And there were just eight souls on it. And the water began to rise. It wasn't funny then, was it? And guess what? It's not going to be funny when you and I stand before the great white throne unprepared. And so it's in our best spiritual interest to prepare to make ready. Jesus said many will enter the wide gate and few will enter the narrow gate. Many will be lost and only a few will be saved. So saith the Lord. Remember last night that little exercise I challenged you with? Go home and read the obituary section. And come back and tell me how many folks went to hell. <laughs> I can save you the trouble at a time. I've yet, personally, I'm sure they exist. I'm sure there's someone somewhere that wrote an obituary that had suggested that that person. I'm sure there's one out there. But you're going to be hard pressed to find one. Jesus said that there's going to be more people that are lost than there are that are saved. In Romans 14, 12, Paul said, So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Number four, the greatness of God is judged. How about greatness and justice? Regardless, again, of my rank, my race, my social status, my wealth or power, I'm going to be judged. That one will be judged according to what he's done, whether good or bad. John said in Revelation 20, 12, And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Justice will be served in judgment as, in Romans 2, 16, God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Lots of folks looking for justice today. And it may or may not happen in this lifetime, but we can be sure that it will happen in the judgment. That justice will be rendered. And there's greatness. The greatness of God is judge, greatness, and justice. Those who fail to obey will be punished. 
In Matthew 7, 21, the Sermon on the Mount is about to come to a close. It's drawing to a close. And Jesus says that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now listen, verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And you try to think about some modern day application. You know, God, you know, Lord, we've played softball games in your name. We've built uh, these, these mega church buildings with McDonald's in them in your name. And we've built these fancy gymnasiums and we've played basketball in your name. Up in uh, uh, Akron, when uh, one of our members brings me the paper from Canton, uh, I read about things churches are doing. Uh, about five years ago, one church hosted a WWF or WWE wrestling tournament. Now, picture that. In the day of judgment, Lord, did we not host a wrestling tournament in your name? you imagine what the Lord's going to say about that? He, he, he does care in one sense, but in another sense, he doesn't care, right? Where, where does it say in the Bible it's the work of a church to host a wrestling tournament? That, that, that supposedly spiritual people can come to to be edified. Now, how in the world is a wrestling or wrestling tournament going to edify the body of Christ? It's not. It's not God's intention for that avenue. And you name it, churches are, seriously, you name it. Go on the internet, you name it. There's a church out there somewhere that's probably doing it. And if not, they'll soon be doing it. Think about it. Jesus said, many are going to say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not? And they're going to profess to have done all sorts of things in his name. And Jesus is going to say in verse 23, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, there's nothing wrong with softball. My daughter played softball. I played men's softball after I graduated high school for a few years. Uh, there might, there's, there's some members of this church. We played flag football from, yes, grown men, played flag football from like 2003 to 2008 up in the Akron, Ohio area. Nothing wrong with it in and of itself. We've, we've played basketball. We've, we've done all sorts of recreational activity. In and of itself, those things are not sinful. But those things do not belong to the church. It's not the church's duty to entertain or provide recreation. Those things belong to the home. And that's great. That's fantastic. And so as, as individuals, you and I can go and do, right? We can go play softball and basketball and golf or whatever it may be, whatever you like to do, as long as it's godly and as long as we're doing it in a godly manner and we've, you know, dressed in a godly fashion, we conduct ourselves in a godly manner, nothing wrong with it. But those things are not the responsibility of the church, and in part, the Lord here is saying, listen, these people are going to say they're doing things in my name. But they don't have authority to do so. Playing softball in the name of the Lord. Jesus is going to say, again, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Look at verse 21 again, the last sentence. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. That's going to be those. Those are going to be the ones who are permitted entrance into the kingdom, the eternal kingdom of heaven. Those who obey the rule." Of the Father in heaven. Jesus is said to be in Hebrews 5 and in verse 9. He is or became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Now he didn't say he became the author of eternal salvation to all those that play softball in his name. That's not what he said. And listen, I'm not trying to make light of, you know, religious groups that do those things. But again, it's not the work of the church. The work of the church consists of three primary areas. Number one, evangelism. First and foremost, the primary work of the church is to preach and proclaim the gospel. Secondly, to edify the local body, to build up. Right? And so those who obey the gospel and baptism, they're to be taught, they're to be edified. Edification comes through the teaching of God's word. The hearing, believing, obeying God's word. Right? Four, do my math in my head, from Romans to Revelation, 22 letters, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, book of Acts. 27 minus 5, 22. Romans to Revelation, 22 letters. From Romans to Revelation, those letters are written to Christians, some individual Christians like Titus and Timothy, Philemon, 
Some of those letters written to churches, like the church at Ephesus or Corinth. But churches are made up of, the body's made up of, obedient believers, Christians. So those 22 letters were written to Christians. A great portion of the content of those letters deal with Christian living. How we're to live in this life. Live obedient and render faithful service to God. Because of the grace, mercy, and love of God, no matter what sin I've committed, if I obey him, I can be saved. A lot of folks have been told or think, I've just been too bad. There's no way God's going to forgive me. I've lived an awful life. And guess what? Maybe you have. Maybe you've just completely forsaken God and you've done some terrible things, of which we ought to be ashamed of. But if I will submit or subject myself to God's will and his authority, if I will respond and obey him, he will forgive. You don't believe me, read the book of Acts. You read the book of Acts and come back and tell me God won't forgive you. Saul of Tarsus was involved in murder. He was an accessory to murder. He consented to the death of Stephen. He didn't try to stop it. He's standing there collecting coats. And he consents to it. Later, he goes to Damascus to bind Christians. What do you think he wanted to do to them? What do you think he wanted to happen to them? Yeah, he wanted harm to come upon them. In order to be saved, I've got to respond and be faithful to God. I've got to hear God's word. I've got to believe in God. I've got to repent of my sins. Confess my faith in Christ and be baptized. But we must not forget that baptism is not the end. While in our initial obedience we are to put off the old man or the worldly deeds, we're to arise to walk in newness of life. So be faithful. Don't look back. One of my favorite texts to make that point comes from Hebrews 10, verse 35, starting through 39. The Hebrew writer tells his audience not to look back. For them, don't look back to the old law. They weren't to look back, but go forward in their faith. And so we too go forward. Don't look back to the old man, the, the, the filth that we lived in, the sin that we lived in, but push on, be faithful, grow, mature spiritually. And make no mistake about it, justice will be administered in the day of judgment. And lastly tonight, greatness in finality, regardless, again, of one's rank or lot in life, when the verdict is rendered by the great judge, it will be final. John said, then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The book of life is the Father, God's family records. The Bible speaks of eternal damnation and eternal life. And I'll be honest, it's a challenge for me to wrap, wrap my finite mind, my limited Ability around the concept of eternity, eternal, never ending. You think about some of the worst pain you've ever been in. When did you want it to go away? Not like Pharaoh with the frogs, right? You want the pain to go away tomorrow? No, you want it to go away right now immediately. So what do we do? Well, right? You do everything you can. You take medicines or whatever it may be to help you help the pain go away. Eternal. He who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. If I blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, that, that just simply means that I'm not being obedient to God. If I stand in opposition to God, I'm blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And if I don't repent, I won't have forgiveness. And therefore, I will be subject to eternal damnation. My point would be eternal, never ending. Paul said to Timothy, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life. The righteous will receive eternal life. The unrighteous, eternal condemnation. Lots of religions teach annihilation. No, the Bible doesn't teach annihilation. There are some English words that may seem to convey that. But you know, you know what the Bible means when it talks about eternal damnation? It means loss of well-being. Think here. Loss of well-being. Think about it. If I'm sentenced to eternal damnation, wouldn't that be an accurate description? Loss of well-being? It's not going to be a pleasant place to, to be. Hell is going to be difficult, to say the least. How long is eternity? It is forever. Never ending. I'll be honest. That was one of the thoughts at the age of 13 that I was thinking about. 
I can remember being brought to tears at the age of 13 when I contemplated eternity. Never ending. I, I can't imagine. Ne, ne, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to wrap my mind up. Never ending. But on the other side of eternal damnation is eternal life. Right? No pain, no sorrow, no suffering. The glory of God is going to illuminate eternal life or heaven. Once the righteous decision is made, it's final. It's death, then judgment. No time or changes in between allowed. And so where we spend eternity will be decided while we're on the face of this earth as to how we live. God never intended for this present world to last forever. Peter said, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. There's going to come a day, a time when Christ returns and this earth will be no more. It'll be dissolved. It was, it's not God's intention for us to live on this earth forever. And so there you have it. The greatness of God as judge. And when you think about the greatness of God as judge and the throne scene that is depicted in Revelation 20, what do we see? We see greatness in authority, greatness in sanctity, greatness in impartiality, greatness in justice, and finally, greatness in finality. And Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 2, Now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Today, there's no better time than the present to make ready to stand before the judge in the day of judgment. I very much appreciate uh, your attention uh, this good week. I just came from Peyton City, and their VBS lasted 50 minutes every night. 50 minutes. So I emailed uh, one of the deacons to find out how long I had to speak this week, and it would have been 38 minutes, give or take. <laughs> I appreciate it very much. I usually preach about 22 to 28 minutes every Sunday, every sermon. And so 35, 50 minutes, that's a long time. I'm not too long. When I was growing up, the preachers would get up there and they would say, stand up, speak up, shut up, and sit down. And sometimes they did and sometimes they didn't. But I try to do that. I just stand up, tell you what I'm going to tell you, tell you, tell you what I told you, and sit down. And so I appreciate this, this week you being patient with me and being very attentive to the things that we have studied together. And uh, again, some of you have given me email addresses. Um, you wanted that chart, uh, what must I do to be saved chart. Lots of folks uh, over the years where I've preached have asked for it. They take it and make a copy of it and they put it in their Bible or they put it in their Bible carrier and and they can use it and show people when they're trying to study with people. So if there's anything in, in these lessons that I've shown on the screen or, or maybe when I'm rattling off verses and you didn't have a chance to write those down, you just see me uh, and, and give me your email address and tell me what it is that you'd like to have. And I'd be more than glad uh, to provide anything that would be useful to you in your personal studies or in your endeavors to share the gospel with uh, someone else.
song of encouragement together to perhaps encourage one that might be in this good assembly tonight who would need to respond to the Lord's invitation tonight and obey the gospel and baptism. Or if a Christian and you're living in error, sin, that you would come and confess your sins and repent and pray to God for forgiveness. Before I ex extend the invitation tonight, I just do want to make mention, it's been said by the elders here, but I am fully aware of the sacrifice of the teachers this week and, and, and the efforts that they put in. They volunteer, they sacrifice their personal times, they're working jobs day in and day out, and so they make time at home uh, to study and put the material together. And so a, a, an effort like this this week could not be done without a collective cooperation of the members here. And so from the elders down to the deacons, to the members, to the, those that volunteered to teach those classes. Uh, I always praise our teachers at Barberton because I, I, mean, I know what it takes to prepare lessons and material and, and then to have children in class and to be able to teach. And so it's a very serious responsibility and you ought to be praised. And of course, all of those that had come this week and sat in the adult class, I always tell folks when I go to meetings, if... Uh, you know, p part of having a, having a successful meeting is having people here. And if you don't believe me, then just don't come back to the next one. And if, if no one shows up, uh, you know, you, you can see that it would be some challenges to that. And so just uh, from me to you, uh, thank you so much for your uh, sacrifice of time and, of course, your talents and, and your good work this week and good efforts. In the book of Acts chapter 22, in verse... Let me back up. Let me move forward. How about Acts 24? Acts 24 and verse number 25. It says, Now as he reasoned, Paul, he's with Felix. It says, Now as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and judgment. By the way, that's a three-point sermon for you fellows that preach. <laughs> that's a good three-point sermon. Paul is reasoning about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. And it says, Felix was afraid and answered, go away for now when I have a convenient time. And how many folks are saying that even today? Maybe you're here tonight and you're saying, at a more convenient time, I'll become a Christian. <laughs> or if you're a Christian who's an heir, at a more convenient time. When's that convenient time going to come? Folks say, well, when my children are all grown up, it, it'll be more convenient. Or when my kids are done playing sports, it'll be more convenient. Is it ever really going to get, if you will, as we would see it or have it, more convenient? Felix, I'll, I'll call for you at a more convenient time. I would suggest to you tonight that there's no more convenient time than the here and now. Tonight. Right now. Why? Because we're not guaranteed tomorrow. I don't know if I'm going to have another opportunity beyond this evening to make my life right with God. Remember that obituary exercise? Here's another one for you. Go through the obituary and look at the ages of those people. I won't mention names, but we have a young lady who's going to celebrate her 94th birthday here not too, not too far away. Not all of us are going to live to see 94. Read the obituary section, and you know what you're going to find? You're going to find people of all ages, from very young to those that have been blessed with some 90-plus years in this life. And what it is, it's, it's reality. I don't know. We have the expectation that we're going to live to a certain age. But I don't know. We don't know. My, my life could be taken just by uh, an accident. I could be driving down the road and my light is green and someone's on their cell phone not paying attention. They run the red light and they ride into the side of my car and that's it. I'm gone from this earth. You just, we just never know. We're not guaranteed a certain length of life. And so there is no more convenient time than the here and now, than the present. This evening, right now, you can respond to the Lord's invitation to come and to follow Him. And tonight, you can obey the gospel in baptism. How about Agrippa? Remember what Agrippa uh, told the uh, Apostle Paul? In Acts 26, 28, Agrippa said, You almost persuade me. Now, as a preacher, I like to give Agrippa the benefit of the doubt. It's possible that he was mocking him, but I, I do believe that he was being, to a certain extent, sincere. You know, Paul has talked about the gospel. He's talked about things Agrippa was familiar with in regards to history. 
And so, Paul, you've almost persuaded me to become a Christian. What do we say all the time? What's the old adage? Almost doesn't count except in what? Horseshoes and hand grenades? That's kind of, the, kind of the saying is how it goes. But when it comes to salvation and being saved from our sins, almost isn't going to get it done. I have to respond to God's will and his authority and obey. And so don't be like Felix. Don't be a procrastinator. Don't think, that's what the devil's, that, that's him working on your heart. Oh, there'll be a more convenient time. Will there? Or almost persuaded. Why are you almost? Let's be fully convinced tonight. And you can come and obey the gospel. And you can leave this building tonight. You can go home. And I would trust that perhaps you would have the best sleep. You ought to have the best sleep you've ever had in your life. That knowing if you were to depart from this earth this very moment, you're in a safe condition. And that you would be able to rest eternally in heaven. And so we're going to sing the song tonight, a song of encouragement that has been selected. If you're here tonight and need to obey the gospel and baptism, or a Christian, you've erred or sinned and need to make corrections in your life and do so before the church, we'd be glad to assist you tonight if you just come while together we stand and sing.